waiting online, Mr. Chesnokov, you should now ask for the floor. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I believe you can hear me. We can hear you very well. Good. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. President, uh, dear members of the committee, dear participants of this public hearing, at the outset, let me thank you on behalf of the Ministry of Youth and Sports of Ukraine for the opportunity to address the important issue of today's international sport. 14 months passed since Russia, with the support of Belarus, attacked Ukraine, violating the Olympic truce. The decisions and recommendations taken by the IOC on 28 February last year to prevent Russian and Belarusian athletes from participating in international competitions were logical and absolutely fair. They were based on the exceptional circumstances of the situation, as the IOC stated that time. Then, the IOC distinguished the Russian-Ukrainian war among other conflicts in the world. It was again logic that the ministers responsible for sport at their 17th Council of Europe conference last October in the resolution number one uh, condemned the Russian Federation's aggression towards Ukraine and considered that the Russian Federation and Belarus should not be represented in international sport as long as this aggression continues. Ukraine adheres to the unchanging opinion that amid the still ongoing unprecedented brutal military aggression of the Russian Federation supported by the Republic of Belarus against Ukraine, representatives of the aggressor states must not perform on the international sports arenas in any status. Unfortunately, nothing has changed during 14 months of this war. The situation on the ground is deteriorating. The world is shocked by atrocities and war crimes are being committed by Russian troops with the full support of Belarus. 287 Ukrainian athletes and coaches were killed. About 40,000 athletes were forced to move abroad among 7 million refugees. More than 340 sport facilities were severely destroyed or damaged in Ukraine. No actions to demonstrate Russia's desire to end this war, bloodshed and terrorism have been taken. Russian and Belarusian athletes have either not made any statements regarding the need to stop the aggression against Ukraine and liberate the sovereign territory of our state. Even the statement of the president of Russian Olympic Committee, Stanislav Poznyakov, that military service for protection of Russia's interest in the war against Ukraine is a matter of honor for Russian athletes, failed to raise any red flags with the IOC regarding the political bias of Russian athletes or in violation of the Olympic Charter. Despite the universal condemnation of the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine, many Russian athletes continue to actively support the policies of Vladimir Putin and boldly demonstrate the approval of the war. As you know, on the 28th of March this year, the IOC Executive Committee adopted the so-called recommended conditions of participation of Russian and Belarusian athletes in international sport competition, whereby it proposed international sport federations to admit Russian and Belarusian athletes, as well as officials to international sports competitions upon the principles of neutrality. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine have a lot of concerns concerning this decision. Moreover, we believe the IOC failed to establish an effective mechanism of prevention of using sports as a tool of propaganda by Russians and Belarusian athletes who represent only the government through the state funding and there is no other way of participating for them uh, in the, as the members of the national teams. There are no prevention security measures for Ukrainian athletes and fans at the international sport competitions uh, to be proposed by the IOC. As well, there are no uh, any prevention for spread of hate speech against them. I would like to use this opportunity to address the background of the IOC decision. At the core of it, 
are the conclusions of two UN special rapporteurs dated 14 September 2022, 20, uh, in which they urge the IOC to adopt a decision to ensure the non-discrimination of any athlete and accordingly noted that the ban of Russian and Belarusian athletes, I quote, based solely on their nationality, end of quote, constitutes discrimination. It must be noted, however, that the IOC's heavy reliance on alleged human rights violations is unjustified and without legal merit, where the conclusions of the UN special rapporteurs are premature and incomplete. So, first, both the rights of athletes to participate in, sport, in sports competitions and right of non-discrimination are not absolute and could be surpassed by wider considerations of public safety and wider interests of whole sporting community. Second, the conclusions of the UN special rapporteurs omit consideration of mandatory legal instruments governing the IOC, including the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, respective jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, and the Lex Sportiva and jurisprudence of the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Notably, none of the international human rights instruments provides for the right of athletes to participate in the international competitions without any restrictions. To the contrary, recently, the CAS confirmed lawlessness of the position of the international uh, 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 football associations to ban Russian football teams from the participation in their competitions because, I quote, the right to participate in competitions is not absolute. Similarly, the European Court of Human Rights in its jurisprudence recognized that the difference in treatment and limitation of individuals' rights and freedoms may be a justifiable measure if it is pursues a legitimate aim, such the aim of ensuring public safety, restoration of peace, protection of national security. In such a case, a measure is not considered discriminatory and thus as such that unlawfully infringes human rights. It is important to note that the uh, Russian Federation breached the Olympic truce by waging an aggressive war against Ukraine without taking no efforts to restore the peace by leaving the illegally occupied territories. The safety concerns associated with potential participation of Russian and Belarusian athletes and their supporters are still in place and even deteriorated, as indicated by the recent examples of multiple confrontations between Russian and Ukrainian athletes as well as spread of hate speech and war propaganda by Russian supporters in course of sporting events. Therefore, the interest of organizers of sporting competitions to run them without disruptions and the general aim of ensuring safety of all involved, both participants and general public, is a legitimate non-discriminatory measure that takes precedence over the right of Russian and Belarusian assets to participate in such competition. It is worth mentioning that already after the announcement of the IOC recommendations, some officials of the aggressor countries, including the self-proclaimed president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, announced that they would allow athletes to perform under a neutral flag for the sake of their presence at sports competition. Thus, no, those officials did not even try to conceal the approval of the IOC decision, which definitely undermines the latter, its role and weight, and also causes enormous reputational damage to such an international institution as the IOC. Undoubtedly, those international organizations that support the IOC recommendation will also suffer, suffer reputational damage. In addition to their blatant unlawlessness, the IOC recommendations give rise to many challenges associated with their practical implementation, which once again testifies to their irrationality, imperfection, and inappropriateness in the current conditions. Neutrality in sport is rather a broad concept. Therefore, to ensure accurate assessments and avoid any potential misunderstandings, it is crucial to establish unambiguous and specific criteria for determining neutrality in each particular sport taking into account its unique features of programs and disciplines, rules of the kind of sport, etc. It's not surprising that the IOC recommendations do not enlist instructions on the criteria which international federations should follow to determine or verify compliance by assets and officials with the principles of neutrality. It's, uh, uh, it is practically impossible to fulfill, especially considering that the IOC, as well as any 
any individuals cannot but realize that among the Russian and Belarusian athletes who are members of the national teams can be no neutral sportsmen, but only those who support the regimes. Thus, there are currently no accurate and logical explanation and may not be in future as to which action of the asset will testify to their neutrality. That is to say, even the fact that the asset signs a declaration against the war or publicly condemns the war may not be enough to ascertain his or her neutral position, since the asset may conceal his or her real attitude for the sake of participation in the Olympics. Needless to mention anything about the asset who does not express his or her position at all. The Dear Minister, question, sorry that I interrupt you because I want to give just two give me or three one minute. persons the possibility for a question. Uh, just, for, just one minute. Uh, the next practical problem, which is uh, inextricably linked to the first one, concerns the practical possibility of dividing individual competitions into the ones with the participation of Russian and Belarusians and team competitions, which should be uh, held without them. It leads to the conclusion that the IOC recommendations not only fail to address the worsening problems caused by Russian aggression worldwide, but also do not promote the integrity of sport, building bridges and establish no peace. On the contrary, the IOC recommendations raise even more challenges and complicate the activities of competition organizers and international federations, shifting responsibility to them and demanding additional action and decision making, leaving many components necessary for implementation uncertain and without clear legal qualification. I sincerely appreciate Pase unwavering support and would like to reiterate Ukraine's steadfast stance. As long as Russian troops, with the complicity of the Belarusian government, continue to commit acts of genocide against the Ukrainian people, Russian and Belarusian, Belarusian assets must be prohibited from participation in the international sports competitions in any status, including neutral. I thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm looking around. Uh, are there short uh, uh, one question to the Minister Chesnokov? Yes, please. Denisa Negu, please. First of all, I would like to express my deepest sympathy to the Ukrainian people. Uh, those who are fighting so bravely to defend their country, those who have got injured, those who have lost their loved ones, and those that fled, and those who are fleeing to escape Russian bombs. The Olympic Games are about the athletes. So, I want to talk about the Ukrainian athletes also. As you have said, many of the Ukrainian athletes will not be able to participate in the Olympic Games next year. But I would like to know if there are, uh, what are the training conditions right now and if they will be able to participate on the qualifying events that will be happening this year. And also the second uh, short one, the international community hopes that the Russian aggression will stop this year. In the event that this will be happening, what is the Ukrainian position about the participation of the Ukrainian athletes uh, if the, the athletes from Belarus and Russia will be participating uh, even if uh, as a neutral flag in the Olympic Games uh, on next year. Thanks. These two questions. Okay, Madame Heleban, if you are really short in a short question, then you are the next, but then I give back to the minister, yes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your uh, very clear uh, message. And I hope we can meet your demands and um, and not allow the Russian athletes to uh, compete in uh, in Paris. But could I ask you, Minister, what do you uh, expect from the Council of Europe uh, in our plenary session this week when it comes to the decision of uh, the Russian athletes? Thank you for this really clear and short question. Now, Minister uh, Chesnokov, uh, please, can you also give short and clear answers? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, thank you for uh, Ms. Niago and Ms. Kellerland for their, uh, for their questions. So, the, uh, the, first, the answer to the first question, the conditions uh, of uh, preparation of our teams 
So they are preparing, uh, they are preparing and they are participating in qualification for the Olympics at the moment. Uh, their conditions uh, of preparation uh, in Ukraine is very difficult. I would say, I would tell you just one example that uh, for the team of uh, uh, rhythmic gymnastics, the team that moved from Donetsk then to Kharkiv and their sports, uh, their sports complex where uh, were bombed there, so they moved now to Lviv and uh, they, are, they should prepare there with uh, air raid sirens uh, every day, sometimes seven or five times, uh, times a day. So, of course, this is disrupt their preparation. We are also working with our partners, uh, with uh, governments, uh, with the governments, uh, with the uh, national sport federations of uh, Council of Euro member states, for the, for the organizing of the training process for every single uh, Ukrainian sport team uh, who are uh, which are uh, now are based uh, are based out of the territory of Ukraine. Uh, as for the position of the government of the government uh, on uh, participation together with the Russian Belarusian assets in sport competitions, well, this position was formed. Uh, its position is clear. Uh, the government will not support financially or organizationally the participation of Ukrainian teams in such, uh, in such competitions if Belarusian or uh, Russian assets uh, will, be, uh, will be there. This position was formed on the basis of consultations with the uh, national sport federations. There is only one federation, uh, sport federation, the National Federation of Tennis, that was against of this decision. So this decision of the government was taken uh, in consultation with the sports and Olympic community. However, this decision does not prevent those athletes who decide for themselves to, to participate uh, on their um, own uh, decision in the competition. However, Ukrainian, Ukrainian state will not support them financially or administratively, as I said. And uh, speak, answering to the question of uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Helland, I would like to say that uh, Ukraine ex uh, expects from Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe the continuing unwavering support, uh, unwavering support of our sovereignty and territorial integrity within international borders and we believe that for this support, the uh, uh, support for the ban of Russian and Belarusian athletes who are the tools of war propaganda of this both country is very important. I thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, dear minister, I don't know your timetable, but if you uh, follow our, our hearing, it would be nice. And maybe we ask you later uh, to, to, to come back.